From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Board to reconvene. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Gleason. Here. Supervisor Scrivener. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Here. Thank you and welcome to the Tuesday, December 19th, 2017, 2 p.m. session of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. Uh, we're going to begin today's meeting with a report on actions taken in closed sessions. I'll turn to Mark Nations, our County Council. Mr. Nations, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The board met in closed session on items 40, 41 and 42 from the morning agenda. All of those closed sessions were held, but no reportable actions were taken in them. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to follow along with our agendas this afternoon, they are located in printed form on the two tables near, near the exits. We're going to begin with the consent agenda. All items listed with a CA above the item are considered to be routine and non-controversial by county staff. Consent items will be considered first and may be approved by one motion. If a member of the audience wishes to comment or ask questions regarding an item or items on the consent agenda, they may do so prior to a vote being taken on the consent agenda. A member of the board may remove any item from the consent agenda and it will be considered in listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the board concerning the item before action is taken. So at this time I'll read the consent agenda items. Beginning on page two, items three and four on consent. On page five, items five through 10 are on, I'm sorry, on page three, items five through 10 are on consent. On page four, all items 11 through 17 are on consent, however, on item 15, I need to read in this recommended action that was omitted. Uh, the recommended action on item 15 should read approve semicolon auth authorize chairman to sign semicolon direct clerk of the board to record. On page five, all items 18 through 24 are on consent. On page six, items 25 and 26, as well as 28 through 30 are on consent. On page seven, all items 31 through 38 are on consent. On page eight, all items 39 through 42 are on consent. On page nine, all items 43 through 46 are on consent. Page 10, all items 47 through 52 are on consent. On page 11, all items 53 through 59 are on consent. However, on page, I'm sorry, item 55, we're gonna read in this correction to the recommended action. So strike all of the um, printing in capital letters and replace with continue to Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018 at 2 p.m. So we will hear that item next on January 23rd, 2018 during our 2 p.m. session. Next page, 12. We have items 65 and 66 on consent. And finally, on page 13, all items 67 through 74 on consent. And so, are there any members of the audience that would like to make any comment on any of the items on the consent agenda? We have two people, three. Okay, let's start with Mr. Fox. Come forward, please. And then, then we'll have the other two come up. Good, good afternoon, good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Dennis Fox. It's kind of deja vu all over again. I was, uh, last week I talked to you about uh, the cost of uh, cleaning out a sump of half a million dollars. Here on... Uh, Which items are you speaking to, Mr. 30 and, and 47. 30 and 47, thank you. And um, 30, if you can uh, slow down and save some of that, take the energy out of some of that water, you might, could save a bit and mitigate your problems of having to do uh, fixing the Caliente Road, which is um, a little bit pretty soon, you know, half a million here and half a million there. Pretty soon it adds up to real money. So you uh, might want to watch that, and it will improve the cost benefit ratio, which has been a deterrent to uh, 
doing the whole bit on them. Now 47, I'm just using that as an example. Out there uh, in that area, you get these places that are being abandoned. And some of the places you're charging them, you might want to flag them. There's maybe more areas to put sumps in. And if they, you've got a lien on them already for 30, 40,000, maybe you want to buy the property over the time if some of these ever show up pretty good. Also, you've got to remember there's some local water that is flooding the place, so extra uh, little sumps don't hurt. Uh, some of the sumps, I would suggest taking a look at the way they handled uh, the White River that runs through early Mart. That was a bad flood and got us on national news. And they took the White River, they slowed it down. The resource district, no. It was the local Delano Early Mart Water District. And their uh, head is uh, it's run by Mr. Uh, Dale Brogan. And that became uh, the turnip seed wildlife area and got state money for the wildlife area. It's also what the feasibility study suggests doing at uh, the wash. So anyway, it's worth looking at because uh, if you want somebody who knows what they're doing about this stuff, uh, Mr. Brogan, he is a shoe in Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Next comment, please, ma'am, would you like to come forward and let us know which, which item you're interested in, please? Good afternoon. We ask you to state your name for us. Linda Willis. Thank you. Which and item, please? Number 53. Item 53. Okay. And what are your comments, ma'am? Um, is it okay if I just read from my paper? Absolutely. Okay. As Kern County taxpayers, my husband and I are concerned about faith in action. Kern County's request for $5,000 from the Board of Supervisors. According to the organization's Facebook postings, they support citizenship for illegals. DACA opposed Sheriff Youngblood's non-sanctuary proposal for Kern County. Supported a petition to end extreme police violence in Kern County and are critical of law enforcement in general. Kern County taxpayers have different points of view on these issues and the promotion of certain causes. My question to the Board of Supervisors is why is this particular group being singled out for a monetary benefit of $5,000 when there are many different nonprofit organizations that do not receive a benefit from the taxpayers of Kern County? Rather, they are supported by private donors. Why should I be forced to support any group with whom I do not share the same interests? I'm a business owner and know that I do not have unlimited funds, nor with current budget constraints does Kern County have unlimited funds. If $5,000 of taxpayer money is to be given to this organization, the public in, in some way should be polled or given time to ask questions of the board and of this organization. I know what I believe and what nonprofits I donate to, but I doubt that the board could possibly know what organizations any of taxpaying Kern County residents support <clears throat> or whether they would want to support Faith in Action of Kern County. As a government body, you represent all of Kern County, not just a portion or group of it. Therefore, I urge you to vote against using $5,000 of taxpayer money for Faith in Action Kern County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willis. <clears throat> Sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ralph Robles, and I'm also here to speak on uh, item number 53. Okay. And I find it uh, objectionable that uh, one of the members on this board is related to the leader of this uh, group, uh, Faith in Action. Uh, just because you're on the government doesn't mean that your family should be on the government dole. It's uh, nice to uh, subsidize a group that uh, apparently is short on its own funds, 
but to uh, subsidize them with uh, our taxpayer money is unconscionable. As uh, or the speaker before me said, this uh, county does not have unlimited funds. And I've heard talk uh, lately about raising our taxes. We're already seeing an increase in our gas taxes, and the uh, city is talking about uh, raising our sales tax. So uh, this increase in uh, spending, I do not think is justified by the county. Now also, the group that you're talking about funding is a sectarian group. And since when has this county government got into the business of subsidizing any sectarian group? Religion is a private and very personal thing. It is not a uh, item that should be pushed on or subsidized by this government. More so, why are we subsidizing a group that invites competition for our local workers for employment. Our employment sometimes reaches as high as uh, uh, unemployment correction for uh, uh, labor workers, particularly farm labor workers, as high as 47%. Now you're subsidizing people who are inviting competition and you're bringing in unvetted uh, illegals that uh, could uh, provide a potential security threat to the locals as well as this government. You're, by your actions, you are pitting this county against the national law which forbids uh, uh, illegal immigration. This is a form of uh, lawlessness. Since when do the lawgivers promote lawlessness? I beg you to uh, deny this request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robles. Any other comments on the consent agenda? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, I'll return to the board. And um, I see Supervisor Perez has punched in. Supervisor Perez? Thank you, Chairman. I want to respond to those remarks. I received the email from the Bakersfield Tea Party regarding these issues, uh, claiming falsehoods against me. Uh, making accusations that are not true. So I was prepared for uh, to hear from you guys, and I appreciate and respect your legitimate concerns about use of tax dollars. Uh, but, sir, your statement about my brother being involved is false. Uh, I do not have a relative in that organization at all. I'm very close to uh, the uh, director, uh, as he was a foster child in my home 25, 30 years ago, uh, but that is not a relative of mine. Uh, and it is not my brother. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the, this is not the first time that I have given from my discretionary money, as every supervisor does on this board, to organizations that do specific tasks. And so it is very uh, important to me on a personal level that law enforcement and communities, disadvantaged communities in particular, spend time together. Uh, because uh, I believe there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be had, and a lot of benefit that takes place there. Uh, in that vein, uh, and in this same month, uh, I'm giving $5,000 to, or requesting of my board to support a $5,000 to the Sheriff's Activities League uh, so that sheriff's deputies and young children from Lamont and Arvin uh, can go Christmas shopping together. Uh, they spend time together, they get to know each other, and I think build down the, some of the walls and barriers that exist between law enforcement and many communities. Uh, and so I am a big supporter of law enforcement. I've uh, been supporting these programs for some time, and I have supported the incredible work of the Faith in the Valley that is a collection of faith leaders from every faith imaginable. It does not promote one particular religion, as is illegal to do under the Constitution. Uh, and the work is always focused on repairing and improving relationships with law enforcement. And in that vein, I work closely with Bakersfield Police Department, as well as Faith in Action to build, rebuild, and uh, make more healthy the relationship between law enforcement and members of the community. So uh, those are, uh, I read the falsehoods being promoted by the Bakersfield Tea Party. Uh, they're not true, they're political in nature, and I don't wanna be political about this conversation. I think your concerns are legitimate, and I appreciate you raising them. 
Uh, but if we are going to do this to every expenditure of the supervisor's uh, discretionary, very small discretionary money that we get to use for the unique niche needs of our district, then I'm going to ask it be done for every single request that's made on the discretionary. You all have the right to do that and pull that every single time. But I want to give you my word that I do not support divisiveness of any nature, uh, in particular towards law enforcement, who I think have a very difficult job and do a very valiant job. Uh, is why I've devoted so much of my resources and time to, co to correcting what I think is uh, many times a negative relationship that I think is not beneficial to anybody. So my work with uh, Faith in Action has been beneficial. Uh, it focuses on bring, bringing folks together, folks from different uh, faith communities, because they tend to be organized and have access to a lot of people and their parishioners. Uh, but um, in no way is any particular religion promoted. It is multi-faith, and uh, we focus very closely on, um, on helping rebuild those relationships. So I appreciate you raising these concerns. They are legitimate. Uh, they are mostly false, so I, I felt important to correct that and to uh, ask my colleagues to be supportive of this. It is, uh, is pro-social. Uh, it is consistent with what I have done and been and statements that I have made regarding law enforcement, faith community, the community, my district. Uh, so uh, these are heated and difficult, complicated issues. I respect your position. I disagree with it, uh, but I respect it. Uh, and I would ask my, colleague to, my colleagues to consider those remarks uh, as we move forward with uh, discretionary money that we are granted to do particular projects in our districts. So, thank you. May I rebut? Yes. No, we don't have a rebuttal period, sir. Okay, this. Uh, there are illegitimate points that you just made. I, I we've, have paperwork proving it. Ma'am, listen, we've returned this to the board. If you, um, they'll, you'll have another opportunity under public presentations to make, to make so comment. Just I'm returning to the board to ask if, if any member of the board would like to remove any item on the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Couch. I'll ask that item 53 be given spe uh, separate consideration. Okay. Thank you. So we so item 53 will be pulled for separate consideration. Any other items? Otherwise, I'd request a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion on consent. Second. We have a motion and a second with the exception of item 53. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Thank you. And so 53 will be heard in listed sequence. And so, ma'am, now you'll have an opportunity to um, to make further comments on item 53. Okay, so back to page two of our agenda, item number one, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on any matter, not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the board. Board members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may make a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the board at a later meeting. So now I'll ask if there are any members of the public who would like to make comment on any item that is not on this agenda. So item 53 we will hear later. So anyone on any item not on the agenda? Okay, see none then. I'll move on to board member announcements or reports. Okay, see no requests from members of the board. The next item on our agenda will be item 27, this is on page six. This is an item under the, our planning and natural resources department. Update on and request for direction on Rosedale, I'm um, excuse me, on Western Rosedale specific plan issues and specific areas of Metropolitan Bakersfield General Plan regarding sewer and CSA 71 and water for development. And so we have Laura Oviat, the director of said department. Ms. Oviat, when you're ready, please proceed. Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm here today with my partners on this item, uh, the Director of Public Works, Craig Pope, and the Director of Engineering, Survey, and Permit Services, Greg Fenton, who we will all be uh, participating in making this presentation. So this matter is an update, a discussion item, and a request for direction on issues regarding primarily sewer, but we will touch on water issues in the Western Rosedale specific plan area as you know, Western Rosedale specific plan was adopted in 1994 to accommodate growth in the unincorporated areas as ba the city of Bakersfield extends. Uh, the Western Rosedale plan starts at Juetta and then proceeds out to the end of the Metropolitan Bakersfield general plan just past Enos Lane. Those policies, which have been reaffirmed over the years since 1994, require public sewer and water for residential, commercial, and industrial development uh, 
and permit septic tanks only on lots over six acres in size, or a temporary use with dry sewer installed with the development to facilitate connecting to a future public sewer system. Municipal sewer in this area is provided either by the North of the River Sanitary District or by the City of Bakersfield, and to accommodate that growth, an agreement was made called County Service Area 71 that requires payment of fees for connection and capacity. Uh, they then can connect to the city of Bakersfield, and the intention was that, if, that at some point they would annex into the city. Some parcels have also paid for future septic abandonment. As a reminder, and these are issues that will be reviewed by your directors, the capacity and location of the county municipal sewer plant operated by the current sanitation authority does not extend to the western Rosedale area. So I'll turn this over to Mr. Pope, who will go over the issues in CSA 71. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This item uh, presented itself when we received a letter from the city of Bakersfield, and the letter is attached to your board item. And it basically raised the flag saying that we we're building outside of the area that had been agreed upon. And I'll ask Mr. Fenton to show in CSA 71, first, the boundary of the whole thing. The, it's, a, it's a very large area, encompasses all of the northwest Bakersfield metro area. And then we had an agreement with the city of Bakersfield um, back in 1999 for what is the gray area, the shaded gray area. That, the, there's two lines there. One is a smaller line that we actually paid for, and then the gray area, they said they would take all the sewage from that area. But if you're looking at the map of CSA 71, you've got to realize that that's just maybe... 10% of the whole area. What they've done with that letter is they brought it to our attention. We started having regular meetings with them, and we actually hired a consultant to help dig in and determine how much um, capacity is out there. To start with, that gray area, this, the shaded gray area, is about 21,000 homes, and that's how much we agreed with the city of Bakersfield to take. They're still good with that. They're not changing that item at all. They're still uh, happy with the ultimate amount. It runs down a trunk line down Allen Road. So really what they're saying is they have a certain amount of capacity. They're still planning on that 21,000. That's all good. What they brought to our attention, though, was the darker shaded gray areas that are outside the initial shaded gray. In other words, that is development that has occurred beyond what they agreed to doing as far as beyond the area that they agreed to. But it is something that has been built. They're urban areas of development. They are in the county, and they are within what was going to be a future area of sewage connection, but it was never discussed. It was never inked. It was never agreed 100% on how to handle it. So we have a number of homes out there, and it's probably, what, about 1,500 homes mm -hmm. would be our best guess. That's what the details we're running down. They're on dry sewer. In other words, they build them with septic, they have sewers in the road. They're fully planning on hooking up to sewer eventually as the sewer marches out towards them. Our issue is, and the city's concern is, is that we've expanded the area without negotiation, right? That's true. But what we have in our, the good news is that with the 21,000 homes of capacity, um, we've only probably, all the development out there, every bit of it that's happened since that 21,000 was agreed upon, is about 6,000 homes. So there's still plenty of capacity. So what we need to do is continue working with the city of Bakersfield to come up with a plan. I mean, this is where we're looking for direction from your board. But what we're thinking is that we have to honor those homes that we built or agreed on to be built that have dry sewers waiting for hookup. We have to provide a way to get the sewer mains out to them, trunk lines to them. And reach an agreement with the city of Bakersfield that they would agree upon uh, for that purpose. Right now, if you just look at the map, we're outside that, we're outside the agreement. We're not providing, the, we're not providing sewage to them from that area yet because they're still all in dry sewer. But our goal as a, as a county is to make sure everybody eventually gets hooked up to sewer. I mean, that's, the state laws are changing, the regulations are coming down, that they may be mandated, they may mandate us, may mandate the city of Bakersfield to provide that service to them. 
that's one of the big concerns the city of Bakersfield has is they are the ones that take the sewage. They may be required, you have to go hook up those people. And they're going, why should we hook them up? We didn't approve the development. It was out of our basket. Why should they be involved? So we are working with them and we've hired a consultant and we are still in the fact finding stage of that. But what will come out of that we think is a uh, study with a new plan. And the new plan will hopefully lead the way to hooking up those people that are out there that are on dry sewer and still not exceed the amount of capacity the city of Bakersfield had always promised. Because even though as big as CSA 71 is there, there is no more capacity. What they have done is basically put us on notice that the 21,000 equivalent homes is all there is. So we still have a lot of CSA 71 there that doesn't have a direction for the sewage at this point. There are other options out there. There's options of going to North of River Sanitation. There's options of us building a sewer plant, all kinds of things that need to be looked at before we start you know, a whole big scale development. So with that, we have concerns. I mean, we have various thoughts out there. Um, for instance, should we restrict development to only those that can hook to sewer at this point? We are gonna be proposing some projects before long to extend the sewer mains out to the ones that are already out there, at least get those hooked up, if we can negotiate with the city of Bakersfield that they agree to that. But we have to then come up with a plan for the rest of CSA 71, if we're gonna allow development out there to find a way to hook up sewer to them. Or just, you know, that's the th are we gonna just say you can't build unless you can hook to sewer? Are you gonna say no more septic? Our concern is that the state is coming down with new regulations about septic systems. And they're basically gonna say, our guess is they're gonna say there won't be urban development on septic. Probably rightfully so. I mean, the, this sewer is a good thing. And right now we have the ability to still take care of that which is out there. Um, we're not exceeding the limits that the city of Bakersfield already established. We have enough to play with. So we think we can come through with enough um, plans and projects to take care of the people that are out there. There's some in the further areas out. If Greg, Pass Road. Pass Road. Pass Road, yeah. Pass Road, Road that we may not be able to reach. Those will just have to remain on uh, dry sewers for some time. And the, one of our biggest problems with this is how do we get people to hook up to the sewer when, they, when the mains are live? I personally live in a neighborhood that the homes were built over 30 years ago. They promised that sewer was coming within a couple of years. It's been 30 years. It's there now, but I've gone through two septic systems already. So now we've gone through, you know, putting them in, replacing it, and now I have to go spend about $10,000 more to hook to sewer when that fails. But it's just piecemeal. It's one of our biggest challenges of building dry sewers is how you get them to hook up, even if you do get the main out there. So the whole concept of dry sewers is fraught with trouble. Um, our recommendation coming, I think, will be that we only hook to sewer, and that's upon us to provide enough out there that it continues to allow development to occur. Turn over to Lorelei for a moment to talk about the CEQA issues. So in consultation based on this presentation, I have provided in this staff report uh, interim policies that we would, we would be implementing while we wait for the results of this study. So Mr. Pope has been talking about people who actually already have houses. As you can see, there are also open space of property owners that are now starting to come to the planning department and ask for general plan amendments, zone changes, to do lots that are less than six acres, one acre lots, quarter acre lots. The um, recommendation right now is that connection to a public sewer should continue to be the policy for the area and allowing new residential approvals to use dry sewers and septics for a future unknown sewer connection is going to trigger an issue under the California Environmental Quality Act. We are including this area in our general plan update. The timing is good. This study, which is uh, being funded through the general plan surcharge, will 
coincide with our looking at this area, coming up with new general plan policies, doing the environmental impact report, which will be, will take, this whole thing will take about a, a year and a half. And then we, these developers can then have answers to their questions about how much is it going to cost and where are we going to get sewer from. The alternative moving forward would be that these applicants would need to do their own environmental impact report since we have an unknown sewer connection. We have no information about the capacity that we can get, what it would cost to connect. And rather than letting them go on dry sewers and move forward, they could move forward independently if they wanted to go ahead of these projects. Uh, projects that could provide a Wilson letter from the north of the River Sanitary, which there are areas still in that that can do that, or otherwise could provide a Wilson letter from the city of Bakersfield, perhaps it's an older agreement, could proceed with something less than an environmental impact report. But we do need clear direction for developers who are making decisions. We have reached out to the property owners and the developers of interest in that area. We have kept them informed about this. We will continue to include them in the conversations and discussions. And uh, we are looking today for concurrence and direction on these policies so that we can be assured that we are not uh, uh, prematurely for your board, bringing forward projects that uh, do not follow the policies of the Western Rosedale specific plan, but at the same time, give the developers a pathway on how are they going to develop in this area? What is that development gonna look like? The Kern County General Plan update that we're going to be doing for this metro area is going to take the capacity information from this study to look to see how many houses and what will it cost for those houses for this area? How would those be built? What are the kinds of densities that can accommodate the densities that we already have there? What about commercial and industrial? And we need to also fit that into the transportation plan that's also been completed since this, going all the way out to Enos Lane, this map stops at Driver Road. However, the Western Rosedale plan goes all the way past Enos Lane, and we have developers who have come and talked about doing projects there. This is the outer reaches of the transportation system and also now the outer reaches of the current capacity. With that, we'd be glad to answer any questions or thoughts you might have on this. Thank you, Mr. Pope, Ms. Oviat. Um, any questions or comments from the board before I go to the public? Okay, seeing so, you know, none, are there any members of the public who would like to make comment on this item? Please come forward. I see you state your name for us, sir. Good afternoon, board. Justin Beatty with Beatty Homes. Um, just wanted to come up here and thank the county staff um, for keeping my family in the loop. Um, my father, um, Brian, and my grandfather, Ben, started building in the Western Roselle area um, in 1983. Since that time, I've been continuously building custom and semi-custom residential neighborhoods and tracks. Um, and we have um, a number of properties in the Western Roselle area, west of Rudd, um, that uh, are impacted by this issue. And I'd like to thank the county staff, um, Ms. Oviat, Mr. Fenton, and um, Mr. Pope for keeping us in the loop about everything that's been going on. And we've had time to sit down and meet with them individually. And um, Supervisor Couch is also taking the time to sit down with my father, Brian, and I, and talk to us about some of the issues with CSA 71. In addition, um, Brian and I have also met with um, city staff, um, no, uh, Nick Fiddler and uh, Ted Wright. Um, I read through the presentation um, that was prepared by Ms. Oviat's staff. Um, some of the comments that um, my father, Brian, and I have, as far as things that um, we would be in favor of or not in favor of, um, the, the individual package treatment plants provided for um, individual projects, we we're, were not in favor of that. We're, you know, that might allow for development, for us to be able to develop our property sooner, but we think that having small package plants, you know, would not be good in general for the Western Roselle area. We'd be more inclined to have some type of greater system where the county would provide 
um, a new treatment facility or we would send the sewer sewage to an OR sewer district or find some way to um, participate in expanding the city's lines to allow the sewage to flow um, through the city's CSA 71. Um, Um, and again, I guess I'd just like to thank county staff and I'd like to um, request that um, my family and our company, Beatty Homes, just be um, in the loop with regards to um, new developments and the, the county's ideas about how to provide um, sewer facilities for Western Rosedale. And to that end, I don't know, but we would be in favor of some type of program where there could be, you know, like a line item when you pull your building permit where you get the housing track for like a sewer development fee where we would, you know, figure out how many homes are going to be built in the Western Roseville area that don't currently have service and, you know, dividing that by the number of homes and coming up with, you know, a per lot or per house fee to get some of these trunk lines built um, to take the sewage either to the city or to NOR. Um, with that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Beatty. Any other comments from members of the audience? Okay, seeing that, I'll return to the board. This area is largely, if not totally, in Supervisor Couch's district, District 4, and so I'll go to Supervisor Couch first. I would love to share this with any of you that would like to yeah. be involved. <clears throat> By the way, what's Mr. Fenton doing over there? He's just a pretty face today? Okay. Um, well, thank you for your report. I know you've done a lot of work on this, and um, I'll just make some pretty general comments from... Um, the level that I understand this at. And thank you also to Mr. Beatty for, for being here today and providing, providing your comments. Um, at the end of this though, I wanna ask you a question and what, it's really this, what are the questions that you need us to specifically answer for you so you think you have clear direction? Um, I would ask you just to continue to work with the city, North of the River, Sanitation District, the development community um, to see if, those three entities can come up with a plan, something maybe along the what lines of what Mr. Betty just described that can get us where we, where you think we need to get to. Uh, I'd ask you to pursue any and all grant opportunities. Um, ask you to keep in mind uh, to, to the extent you can, because I think, I think this is where it's going to get um, difficult, people's private property rights. Ms. Oviat ran through several things that the planning department can do over the next year and a half or so uh, and, and would do, and I, I think I agree with all of those being included in the, the general plan update. Everything that you said there, it seemed like it, it made sense. Um, I tend to agree with Mr. Beatty about the, the package plants. I, I wouldn't want to see many of them. Um, so those are, those are the, for now, those are my comments, but I wanna ask, are those, are those comments specific enough? Are they too broad? Uh, are there other questions that you need answered? Supervisor Couch through the chair, on page two, there are items one, two, three, and four. I think the important thing is to make sure on item two that your board is comfortable with the policy direction of allowing new residential approvals to use dry sewers and septic systems for a future unknown sewer connection should be placed on hold pending the completion of the study and board direction. This only applies to lots smaller than six acres. So if you are doing some larger parcel map splitting 10 acres for one house in the Western Rosedale, it would not apply. Item number two, though, is is the hot button item. Of I, the, of I the anticipate you, those yeah. are the questions. You've done it before. Why don't we just allow dry septic for the quarter acre lots? We'll connect up someday. You'll finish the sewer. Uh, our problem under the California Environmental Quality Act is I don't know that they'll ever connect to anything. At we this point, it's been daylighted that that may not happen. Right. Well, then, because of that, I think I don't know that as uncomfortable as item two is for many, many people, until we have a better answer, it may be necessary. Um, but that's not to say that that's something that you, anybody over there, anybody up here is uh, relishes, 
but um, so I guess I would also uh, encourage you to work hard, work fast, mm -hmm. come back with your solution as quickly as possible, um, if there is one, and if there, I'd also like you to really start to think, of, and maybe maybe this is what you what you said a moment ago. I would like you to. Um, there are solutions that might entail things like smaller lot sizes, mm -hmm. um, people who live in that area now and enjoy a large lot may not be happy about that, but there may be offsetting um, open space uh, requirements that could be imposed that they might enjoy uh, rather than just another row of half acre, acre lots. Um, so I would, I would be open to ideas like that, and there may be lots of others that you have that I just am not aware of. So those are my comments, and I would, and that's where I would uh, hope the rest of the board would be supportive of those types of measures. Supervisor Couch, and for the members of the public, I want to emphasize we are talking about residential projects. Commercial and industrial projects have different needs, and we would be getting direction. Perhaps they would be. Some would be appropriate for engineered septic. I leave that to the environmental health and others, but we are specifically talking about the major concerns are with residential. The Western Rosedale plan requires commercial and industrial new general plan amendments be hooked up to public sewer. But if they have existing zoning, we certainly would work with engineering on commercial and industrial projects in a different way. I appreciate that distinction, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Couch. Any other comments from members of the board? So I could make that as a, as a motion, if you'd like. Yeah, the requested action is to receive and file, and um, I know staff is seeking direction. I don't know if we need that in the form of a motion or if we just need direction. That's withdrawn. Okay, very good. So um, any other comments? I think every, it sounds like everyone's in concurrence with, with um, what the direction you were wanting to go on that supervisor couch. And so the, mo the request of action is to receive and file, so we have a motion to that effect? Yeah, so moved. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Thank you. Thank you, the vote, the vote is all eyes. Thank you, Mr. Fenton. <laughs> thank, you, thank you to staff. <laughs> Very good, okay, next item on the agenda. Let's see, will be item 53 that was pulled off of the consent agenda. This is an item under the County Administrative Office uh, proposed contribution to Faith in Action Kern County to support civic engagement to build safe and healthy communities in the amount of $5,000. And so um, I will ask Mr. Alsop if there's anything that he would like to um, add to say in, in regards to this before we open it up to the public. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will, um, I'll ask if any members of the board have any comments before I go to the public. Okay, seeing none, we'll open this back up for public comment. Madam Clerk, please set the clock for two minutes per speaker, and we'll ask you to state your name, even if you spoke earlier, and um, observe our two-minute time limit, please. Linda Willis. Um, First of all, um, I don't know what you're referring to with the Tea Party letter that you received. I'm not a member of the Tea Party, so I, I, I understand that. I'm just letting you know that um, the letter you received, I have no knowledge of. Um, I do have knowledge of the Facebook page that um, Faith in Action of Kern County has up on the internet with their postings and their articles. And they um, have several articles in there in support, like I said, of um, support for citizenship for illegals. Um, they oppose the non-sanctuary proposal put out by Sheriff Youngblood. Um, they had a petition to end extreme police violence in Kern County. So those are political um, motivations that they're expressing there, not faith based of any kind. Um, and also I have a letter from 
Joey Williams, who I guess is the head of Faith in Action, in which um, this past July of 2016, there was a conference being held. It was called a Community Organizing Training and Potluck, in which um, it goes through and talks about, I'll just read a little bit of the purpose of our time together. This is Joey Williams speaking. To, is to build relationships and process this moment we are in as a nation, region, and county, also to forge a path forward united with hope. Across the counties of Central California, we have had over 2,000 conversations to begin setting a platform with our agenda and priorities that will dictate the outcome of the November election, not an election dictated by special interests. During our conversations, there are three themes that emerged throughout the region. They were one, jobs, two, clean air and clean water, Three, liberty to captives by ending mass incarceration through school to prison pipeline, end to immigration detention, and implementation of opportunities for the formerly incarcerated. Um, it is their hope that Kern County will come together to let the power holders know we are united as one people in one fight, and these are our non-negotiable priorities that must be taken into account if those seeking office wish to represent us. Again, that is nothing to do with faith. That is a political statement. Um, therefore, you as the supervisors of Kern County should realize that there are many residents in Kern County who agree with that position and many who don't agree with that position. And therefore, I request that you not provide this organization with the $5,000 they've asked for because they are a political outfit based on their president's own words and are after a certain agenda that not everyone supports. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, my name is Ralph Robles. I am a Tea Party member, but I didn't clear my words with the party, so I am speaking for myself. Now I stand corrected on the relationship between uh, Ms. Perez and the leader of the uh, Faith in Action. It, uh, it's a, uh, I, I apologize for any misinformation I may have passed in that manner, however, my other words stand, and that is that one, this is a sectarian group. This, or is, uh, this uh, government is supposed to be non-sectarian, and promoting any religion is uh, not, um, uh, well, it's not moral. And spending the people's money for any agenda that pits the people against its own government by uh, promoting uh, illegal immigration, uh, promotes lawlessness. We uh, today have uh, experienced violence in our neighborhoods and a lot of this violence is brought in from beyond our borders by people who have come here unvetted. We should not be spending money and uh, uh, subsidizing groups that encourage this illegal immigration. We should not be subsidizing groups that promote defiance against authority. We should not be subsidizing an organization that promotes divisiveness. This government is supposed to promote lawful cooperation, not uh, putting up posters with signs of defiance toward the central government, toward our national government. And I beg you again, do not fund these people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robles. Do we have any other speakers, please? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jan Lundy, and I agree with what Mrs. Willis and Mr. Robles have stated before me, so I don't want to repeat that. I would just like to say that um, 
I realized that the money that uh, Supervisor Perez would like to spend on this project are, are her discretionary dollars. Nevertheless, um, they are taxpayer dollars, and I don't believe that taxpayer dollars should be used to fund political groups, and this is definitely a political organization. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm Dennis Fox. And uh, well, this stuff has been going on since Thomas Jefferson, if you'll notice some of these arguments. But what I'm looking at it from is the compromise of the faith in action. But that's their problem. They, may, uh, they have come to this uh, body and uh, protested library hours. That was one of their big things. Will they want to do that now that they are receiving your funds from this county? Or this is mainly going to be their problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Any other speakers, please? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public portion of the hearing on this item and return to the board. Supervisor Perez, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, once again, I want to reiterate my uh, profound respect uh, for the folks that have come here and voice their concerns about their government. This is your government. Uh, I acknowledge that fully, and I respect you immensely. Uh, with that said, um, in addition to this body being non-sectarian or non-sectarian in nature of, of what it supports, it is also nonpartisan. Uh, and issues that were raised today by uh, an admitted member of the Bakersfield Tea Party, which is your right, and I respect that, uh, illegal immigration, um, issues that are not within the purview of this board and that are highly political and highly, highly partisan in nature. One of the reasons why I avoid them altogether because I think they divide people rather than unite us, which I think is what we need to do in local government. Uh, so uh, I, I, will, I, I do want to point out another falsehood that was uh, stated a moment ago, which is uh, violence coming from beyond the borders. The data on violence is very particular and it's very clear. Uh, that uh, violence amongst illegal immigrants is actually much lower than it is with American citizens. Uh, not that that's an issue before us. Uh, I just wanted to raise that as a uh, demonstration of an area that I think factually we're not on the same page and we could be, I think, with more productive conversations that this setting is uh, not the best to have them in, frankly. So I have worked very hard with law enforcement and uh, my district. And in so doing, as a member of the prison board, I brought in a half a million dollars to the BPD uh, to work with detectives there uh, and communities of color, frankly, where we have a lot of strife and a lot of, I think, misunderstanding uh, that can be uh, fixed and changed and made better uh, with the right kind of relationships and communication. And so it has been, um, uh, it is with that investment and others from my discretionary money that have worked very hard uh, on this particular and specific project because uh, I have profound respect for our law enforcement. Uh, I do not have respect for um, unnecessary violence towards anyone, be that towards law enforcement or by law enforcement. Uh, but th those are issues that I, that I uh, leave for the experts to, to resolve. Uh, but I believe very strongly that uh, the requests I'm asking of my board uh, is legal. Uh, I think it's moral. I think it, it focuses on a pro-social uh, paradigm for communities that we know are struggling with these relationships. And that has been the exclusive use of the money that I've uh, asked my colleagues to support in the past. Uh, in no way, shape, or form will I promote an anti-social platform or one in which uh, individuals, in particular law enforcement, are attacked. So I appreciate that we have our differences. My colleagues may not agree with me on this. I accept that. Uh, but once again, thank you for your passionate uh, disagreement. I think it's healthy for government. Uh, I accept it, and um, uh, I will continue to work on improving this, and I think you've raised good criticisms. Uh, but I still believe that uh, my request of my colleagues to use this money to continue to improve 
increase the quality of relationship between law enforcement and communities of color, I see as a legitimate valid use uh, without political statements, without partisan positions, which I will, will not allow and not be a part of. So with that said, uh, I submit that to my colleagues and uh, respectfully ask that they approve this request. Uh, and if they don't, I respect that and I accept that as part of the democratic process. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Press. Supervisor Couch, you request to have this item pulled. Would you like to make comment? Well, I did that because uh, people had come to the meeting today and spoken, and I thought they wanted to have us um, have at least a discussion about that about that item, and I wanted to give them a chance to, to say what they wanted to say. And of course, we, may, we had them come back up and held them to two minutes anyway, but that's okay. Um, I don't think it's relevant what uh, political party or what organization you belong to that has really no implication for uh, me and, and whether I'm going to support a particular item or not. I was alerted to this item, uh, I believe it was Friday, and I was alert, alerted several more times yesterday. And in just a very quick uh, research of the Facebook page, I think Ms. Lundy mentioned that. Um, I saw a lot of things that, uh, while I don't agree with them, they were political in nature. And I have tried very hard with, you know, when we do a, in, out of my office, when we do a, a 1040 um, discretionary uh, contribution or, or donation or whatever you want to call it, uh, I don't, I invite the scrutiny, by the way, and on any of those um, items in the past or going, going forward. Um, this particular entity, which I don't know very much about. They may do for some very good things, but because money is fungible, it's hard, it's not, we're not able to say that this dollar is only being spent for this activity. It could very well be being spent for political activity. And it's for that reason alone. I would not support that for a conservative group as well, because I just, I think we should keep the money out of um, these charitable organizations. Um, that are engaged in political activity. So I just, I'm not gonna support this particular item. I don't need to have any uh, further dialogue about it. If, if people wanna talk to me about it and, and try to convince me that I'm wrong about that, I'm open to that. If they wanna try to convince me that I'm in the right spot, I'm open to, to hearing that as well. But I'm just not gonna support this particular item. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Couch. Any other comments from members of the board? Supervisor Gleason. Thank you. I, I, uh, I heard rumblings of this issue uh, the past couple days. I didn't hear anything specific, none really um, significant until I went upstairs for lunch and there's a whole bunch I got a document dump. And so I'm scrambling through trying to understand the issues and um, I have some concerns. But before I issue my concerns, I want to uh, completely assure everybody that uh, I have had the honor and pleasure of working with Supervisor Perez for five years and she's been nothing but a very caring individual, uh, concerned for um, Kern County and I support uh, uh, her efforts in that, in that vein from the beginning and uh, I, I admire and respect uh, the work she does for, for, for Kern County. That being said, um, the issues I have mirror what Supervisor Couch just said and I got these things in my office, these things, I don't know if they're true or not. And I don't even know if you know, Supervisor President, any of these things. I have no idea. But I'm reading an article from uh, yesterday, I guess. Oh, no, it was printed. Oh, I don't know. Last month, maybe something. I don't know. It says the, this, this California Rural Legal, Assist Association, Legal Assistance Team and Greater Bakersfield Legal Assistance, GB, GBLA, and MALDEF filed a lawsuit against Kern County High School District on behalf of Dolores Huerta Foundation. Fine. No big deal. But then it says here, it goes further and it lists that the, in the Kern Education Justice Collaborative, which was potty to that deal, that the Faith in Action group is a member of that. Now, if that's true, which I don't know, and there are other examples in my package, then it indicates, uh, it, it kind of goes along, alongside with what you folks are saying, that there's some political activity, some political, I don't know how much, but there's some, a, 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 a a taste of political activity in, in their actions. And then I have here, it says, and I believe this is true, that they're a faith-based 501c3 charitable organization for federal income tax purposes. And that means that they have to remain um, separate from political activities. 
According to the IRS tax codes, organizations described the 501c3 of the code are exempt from federal income taxes, but they're prohibited from participating or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or opposite to any candidate. Uh, they cannot endorse candidates, make donations, engage in fundraising, distribute sentence, or become involved in any activities that may be beneficial or detrimental to any other candidate, even activities that encourage people to vote for or against a particular candidate, but, but, but. it goes on and on, not only about candidates, but pl general political activities. So in order to, to, to stay uh, with what I've always grown up to be with in the Navy is that we need to be squeaky clean. Um, I, I think we need to be squeaky clean on both sides of the aisle. And uh, I think that's in the best interest of the integrity of our 1040 system and uh, the way we uh, manage our, our precious tax dollars. So I'm uh, sitting on the same side of this one as um, Supervisor Couch. And I, I, I'm, I don't know to the extent that you knew any of those things, Supervisor Perez. I, I, doesn't really matter. I just think that uh, right now that that's not in the best interest of Kern County taxpayers. Thank you, Supervisor Gleason. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. I, I can't say I'm familiar, Mick, with the details of that particular suit. Uh, you said against a high school district, correct? I, I get it. Okay. I got a whole bunch of can you explain to me why you perceive that as being political? If it was true, and I can't say that I know one way or the other, but why? tell me why that's political to you. Because it's political because it's a... Your, mic, your mic needs to go on. Oh. Okay, it's political because it was, it was... I read those with a bunch of other articles that I got here that talked about political activities and political actions, and I could go through them. Well, those are legal actions, so how is that political in your mind? It, it's political because it's, mo uh, it's moving uh, uh, the mindset, the political mindset of the voters uh, towards a support of, uh, of, of some aspect of, of uh, our immigration, federal immigration policies. <clears throat> oh, okay. So the example you and, and gave I'm, about... I'm looking in, in with, with other issues that, that I'm scanning through here real quick that I just got this afternoon. Okay. Okay, I, I, I mean, I, I um, okay, I think it's a complicated issue. I think so too. I, I acknowledge that. And uh, I, I, I really don't want to proceed in a divisive manner with my colleagues or frankly put them on the spot. So I'm going to ask that this matter be pooled and I want to sit down with the CAO, Supervisor Couch and Gleason separately if they're open to that and uh, see if we can find some middle ground on this area. Uh, rather than proceed with what is clearly going to be a divisive vote. So um, I have some things I agree with. I have some concerns based on what I've heard today. Uh, I still believe uh, what I'm asking is righteous. And frankly, the whole tax code might change completely. And in a month, we may be talking about a completely different scenario where uh, tax-exempt organizations will be quite political. So there's some irony in that. Uh, but I've, I will ask the chairman to pool uh, this matter, and I would like to discuss it with our CAO and my colleagues who have concerns. And I appreciate your uh, civil and respectful uh, discourse today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Press. So the, she's asked the item be pulled, so this will be withdrawn by the, by the department then? That's her request. Yes. Okay. Right yeah, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we're withdrawing that item. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is any other any other further action required? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Perez and Supervisor Gleason and Couch, and for the members of the public who are here to discuss that item. So then we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is under the County Administrative Office Human Resource Division. These are these items are all related. Items 60, 61, 62, 63, and 64. And so we're going to hear these items concurrently, but we will be voting separately on each of the five items. And so I'll ask Ryan Alsop, uh, Alsop our County Administrative Officer, to start us off, but I know he's going to kick it to Devin Brown, who heads up our Human Resources Division. So Mr. Alsop, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, first, this I know this is your last meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we go to a new chair, I think. I think this is the last meeting. Anyway, I wanted to say, um, while I had the opportunity to thank, thank you for your leadership, your office's leadership, and the working relationship that, that you've had with the CAO's office. And I also want to thank the board, um, before getting into this, for the leadership you're continuing to provide on addressing our budget challenges uh, and on your commitment to making Kern County a model of excellence and managing the business that we do and, and, our, and our people. 
Uh, Kern County remains focused on building a pathway out of our fiscal crisis. And we are in a second year of a plan for your mitigation strategy, as you know, to get ourselves into a more sustainable fiscal position. Even though we have a seri uh, serious fiscal challenges, that doesn't mean we can, we can ignore the leadership, management, and workforce development responsibilities uh, we have in running an organization with, with uh, thousands of employees. We have to be smart and creative in how we balance these responsibilities along with our effort to get fiscally healthy. This requires trust, a little courage, and a full team approach. All of us headed in the same direction, supporting one another. As our employee contracts come up for renewal, we're working hard to find ways to acknowledge and appreciate and invest in our most important resource while we work for opportunities to improve the county's fiscal position. This is not just a practice in our employment contracts. We are doing this in every business area of the county every day. The two-year agreement before your board uh, with SEIU uh, today uh, represents uh, as, an, as an example of this effort. We were not able to accommodate a raise uh, for this bargaining unit at this point. We are attempting to reward our employees in a creative, intangible way. We recognize it's not the long-term change they wanted to see, but we hope that it is indicative of a commitment to support them, even in the midst of a severe fiscal challenge. A few thank yous. I want to say thank you to Devin Brown and his team, our Human Resources Director, for his hard work. This is many, many months of hard work. Thank you to the county's department heads for all of their support and involvement in this. Special thank you to SEIU's leadership team, not only for understanding and acknowledging the tough fiscal situation that we're in, but also for their representation of county employees. They're tough, hard to deal with at times, and they make sure we have a full appreciation of the concerns of their membership. These are all things you want in good union representation, in my opinion. Most importantly, I want to thank the thousands of SEIU members who are employed throughout the county for their service sacrifice and their partnership. Um, we have lots of, I believe we have nine, at last count, 93 of our firefighters who are over fighting the Thomas fire. That's 16 miles away from, I'm, I'm told today, 16 miles away from the Kern County line at this point. Uh, but they're over there fighting and we also have our um, uniform, our sheriff's deputies are several in the room today and, and patrolling our streets. They are heroes and they are uh, important county employees. But you don't need to wear a badge and you don't need to wear a uniform to be a hero or to be brave. Uh, you don't need to drive a fire truck to have courage or to make an impact in the lives of county residents uh, or even to save lives. SEIU employees show us this every single day. The work that they do is among the most important work anyone does, whether you're in government service or not, period. I thank them very much for their support and trust, and with that, I'll kick it over to Devin Brown, our Human Resources Director. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The County Administrative Office is pleased to provide your board with three proposed agreements with Kern County's largest employee organization, SEIU, and two proposed resolutions, one to implement changes to unrepresented staff and the other to implement the provision for an extended holiday facility closure. Before going into further detail about the items before you today, I'd also like to express my appreciation for the two bargaining teams that dedicated their time and expertise to making these agreements happen. Further, I'd also like to express my gratitude to each department head and their staff for working to implement the new changes contained in each agreement, and there are a lot. And finally, I'd like to personally thank our staff with the auditor controller who have worked diligently over the past couple weeks to put these changes into reality in a very tight timeline. As Mr. Alsop headlined, these agreements were developed with a and reached with the goal of Kern County becoming a model of excellence in managing our business and people. Specifically, we are seeking to follow through with two key strategies, eliminating our structural deficit and retaining and rewarding our employees. At first blush, these two strategies may seem in conflict, but through creativity and an innovative mindset, the parties were able to reach agreements that, take make, that make gains toward each strategy. The agreements before you today include significant ongoing savings conservatively estimated at $1.5 million annually. 
The changes include the following. Overtime compensation will be solely based upon a 40 hour work week and not an eight hour work day. This will allow departments and employees greater flexibility in managing their weekly work schedules without necessarily resulting in additional overtime compensation. The 40 hour maximum hour requirement for overtime will now be calculated looking only at the actual hours worked by each employee. It will no longer include non-productive paid leave time such as sick leave, vacation, compensatory time off, and holidays. And only employees who are non-exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations will now be eligible for overtime compensation. These are big changes to the way we compensate overtime. Additionally, the extra holiday premium compensation for employees who work on a holiday will be reduced from two and a half times the hourly rate to two times the hourly rate. And Kern County will also be permitted with this agreement to seek long-term savings through additional contracting out of remote maintenance, landscaping, and custodial services throughout the county. These are big deliverables for Kern County and sacrifice made, sacrifices made by our SEIU members in recognition of Kern County's fiscal emergency and four-year fiscal deficit reduction strategy. In exchange for the savings just mentioned, SEIU members will be the beneficiary of several items that are also geared toward rewarding and, re rewarding and retaining Kern County's talent. Directly in exchange for the overtime changes I mentioned above, SEIU members will be given two one-time non-pensionable retention bonuses of $500 each. The first of these bonuses will come in mid-January of next year and the second after the next fiscal year in July of 2018. These retention bonuses amount to an average of a 2% one-time salary increase over two years. Kern County has also added with this agreement Veterans Day as an ongoing paid holiday beginning in 2018 for permanent SEIU members. And finally, Kern County is implementing an extended holiday closure period called winter recess for the week, including Christmas, the Christmas and New Year's holidays in both 2017 and 2018. This will give employees three additional paid days off during each calendar year. With Veterans Day, those three days will amount to about a 3% uh, increase in the employee's uh, compensation package. The bottom line is this agreement includes employee benefits totaling an average of 5% of salary over a two year period. Although management and mid-management will receive the additional winter recess days proposed under this resolution before you today, uh, the proposed one-time bonuses will not apply to management, mid-management, or elected officials. The winter recess, uh, there's some more details about that proposal. So the proposed winter recess on December 26th, 27th, and 28th are traditionally the days with light staffing staffing and a low volume of services provided to the public. Each department has been tasked with providing the county administrative office a closure and service plan that keeps essential services available to the public and skeleton staffing plans to meet those service needs. While not all county facilities will be closed, those that are typically closed during county holidays are included during this extended closure period with very few exceptions. The County Administrative Office is compiling each departmental plan and will be providing the public with that information upon adoption by your board of these items today. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that your board approve the three agreements with SEIU before you today and authorize the chairman to sign those agreements and adopt the two resolutions before you today uh, for the management, mid-management, and confidential terms and condition changes and the the re resolution for uh, closure of public facilities uh, for the winter recess. And it's our recommendation that, like you said, Chairman, uh, a separate vote on each item should be taken. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Does that conclude the CAO's comments? Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board before I go to the public? Okay, we'll now open this up. Any members of the public that would like to make comment on this item?
Good afternoon, Chair Scrivener. Being new to this uh, environment, I hope I do right. Uh, and honorable members of the board, Ms. Kraus, Mr. Alsop. My name is Liz Keogh, K-E-O-G-H. I am a proud resident of the 5th Supervisorial District. And I um, have been very concerned, Mr. Alsop, since I looked at the things online after 2 p.m. on Thursday about the wording of the resolution concerning the closure of county public buildings. Uh, I have expressed this concern to each of the members of the board uh, and without any, I want to say adjectives, it implies that all county buildings are going to be without heat, without light, without water. Um, and I don't think that's your intention. Uh, your description towards the end of your presentation mentioned departments, not buildings. And I think that's where the issue is, that there, the wording of this should reflect what you mean, which is skeletal staff, if you will, in certain departments. I'm sure there are certain departments where the employees can go on furlough without a major disruption when they return on January 2nd. But to say that the county public buildings will be closed from December 26th through December 28th, to a member of the public it means I can't go to any county building. And of course the absurd implication is since the jail's a county building, we're gonna close that down. Since Jameson is a county building, we're gonna close that down. Animal Services on Fruitvale Avenue is a county building, so we're gonna close that down. And what are we gonna do with the animals? What are we gonna do with the inmates? What are we gonna do with the kids? So I think that the, as you describe it, the intent is good. And if the data have shown that this is not highly traffic time for normal things, like I presume the clerk's office, the planning department, and so on, that does not eliminate the fact that people are gonna beat up their spouses, children are going to be beaten up, animals are going to be roaming the streets and biting kids, and so you do need some staffing even during a, a low consumer, uh, you know, uh, uh, consumption of service by the residents. So is there any way that this resolution can be reworded so that the matters that you mentioned at the end of your presentation go into the resolution rather than having it stand as is and philosophers like to talk about the man in the moon or the man from Mars that comes down and reads stuff. <clears throat> if I were a man from Mars and came down and read <clears throat> closure of county buildings through the dates of December 26th through December 28th, I'm not a mind reader. I wouldn't know that animal services will be providing services, that child protective services will be responding to calls. Um, I have had discussion with uh, Director Cullen of Animal Services, which would surprise no one, um, about how the animals are going to be handled, and he has assured me that, as you have mentioned, he has uh, submitted a plan for the operation of the shelter and the field services staff during this time. 
and I'm sure the other department heads have too. This resolution does not reflect that, and I think it's a disservice to the public to not know what exactly winter recess and closing public buildings means. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you, Ms. Keough. Who will be next, please? We'll have responses to comments after the public portion is concluded. Okay. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Chair and Scrivener and members of the board. My name is Sonia Bennett. I'm the Regional Vice President for SEIU Local 521 and a member of, the, of this year's bargaining team. Last week, SEIU members voted to ratify the tentative agreement that was reached after months of bargaining. While this contract does not reflect cost of living increases, it does reflect a new era in our labor relations that we hope will improve communications and collaboration with management to focus on improving services provided to our community. Beginning next month, we have much work to do to ensure that we are able to retain employees who are leaving our county for neighboring jurisdictions and ease the work, or excuse me, and ease the costs of high turnover rates and constant training. We can work together to address workload and caseload issues that put our community at risk. Whether it is a resident calling 911 in an emergency or an animal control officer being the first line of defense for police and sheriff when entering homes with dangerous animals. We have work to do to ensure that our social workers have the support they need and that they are safe at both their work site and out in the community when protecting our children and seniors from harm. This contract is a commitment from our members to communicate and work with you to resolve these issues that impact our family lives and our personal health, because we are proud Kern County residents as well. This contract is a bridge to our future, and we know we can work together. We hope that each of you will agree to meet with us regularly to discuss these and other matters. We are not just your workers, we are your neighbors. We join you at our kids' sporting events, at community fundraisers, at festivals, parades, and church. We are Kern County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll return to the board. First, I'll ask Mr. Alsop or Mr. Brown if they'd like to respond to any of the comments made by the public. Sure, um, I will uh, provide a response to Ms. Kehoe. I appreciate her comments and uh, coming up here. And uh, I'd only say that I'd be happy to change it, uh, change the, uh, the letter to make sure where it's clear and uh, uh, clarified uh, in the manner that you had described. And uh, I'm not sure uh, whatever I'm able to do about that so that it's official and in the record, Depending on what uh, the, the clerk advises, I'll do. We'll do whatever it is we can there. And then I'll uh, also commit to making sure that our communications, uh, just in general, out to the public um, following this meeting are clear. And that uh, folks know that uh, uh, the animals in our shelter are going to be well cared for. Uh, uh, our inmates are um, supervised. And uh, that's... Uh, and uh, we are operating under a um, a, uh, a county hall uh, county hall county holiday uh, closure protocol, uh, but we'll make sure that we we're we're uh, careful about how we describe it. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. Sorry for the confusion. Thank you, Mr. Alsop. Mr. Nations, I I think that that question falls to you as far as what modifications could be made to the language now to reflect the concerns of Ms. Kehoe, or would your recommendation be that we go forward and then we put an effort forth by our communication team uh, to inform the public in regards to those specificities? Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, you, you could make uh, a change now if we read it into the record and adopt it, uh, and then you don't have to come back on another occasion to um, adopt the resolution. I would suggest just adding a paragraph <clears throat> after paragraph two 
that says uh, county departments who will remain open to provide public services shall make available to the public their schedule for such services during the winter recess. And that would uh, put the onus on each department who is remaining open to make available to the public its, um, its schedule of services and how the public can access them during those uh, three days when the buildings are, most of the buildings are closed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nations. I'll return to the board now. I see Supervisor Perez, you punched in. Thank you, Chairman. Nick, um, Mr. Colon, excuse me, can I ask you a couple of questions? I had some very legitimate concerns raised over uh, what I recognize as a difficult and um, quickly evolving matter, and uh, so I'm really not wanting to be critical of you or the department or any of this process. I just have some questions about the intake process. Uh, where are we right now with uh, intake over the holidays and the implications for the holds and state law and you know the stuff that I discussed with you yesterday? Supervisor Perez, through the chair, um, yeah, our, our, one of our chief concerns, like you mentioned, is uh, we're, man, we're mandated by the state of California to have minimum holding periods for animals. So each animal that comes in on a particular day, they're held a minimum um, amount of time depending on the intake type. So it's usually 72 hours, not including the day of impoundment, four days basically. And it only counts days that are open to the public. So what the winter recess does is it requires us to extend the hold period of every animal that's in the shelter an additional three days. Um, it may not sound like much, but three days um, when you're taking in 40 to 50 animals a day is uh, 150 animals or 120 animals on top of what we already have and, and are required to maintain for a little bit longer. Um, I would let the public know, and I will let the public know, that the animals in the, in the county's care are well taken care of and will be well taken care of during the winter recess. Our only chief concern, like we had spoke of, um, was the uh, holding periods being extended. Um, I know there has been some concern expressed over um, you know, five straight days, the uh, 25th through the 29th of no public stray intake at the county level um, being available. Um, and I had some discussions with the city of Bakersfield today as well and how that might affect their operations. But, you know, we're pleading with the public to uh, work with us the best they can if they can, um, you know, sort of on a foster basis keep those animals until the following Saturday when we're open. We'll be open the 23rd and the 30th. Um, we're trying to do the best we can to address the situation, but rest assured the animals that are in our care will be well, well taken care of. Well, that is certainly good news. I have three dogs. If I, had, if I found a stray, I would not be able to bring that stray home. Uh, it would be too dangerous for all of them probably. Uh, so do we have any other alternatives? Will folks very likely go to the city? Is the city going to look to charge us for those hold periods for dogs that were located or either came from the county and escaped? So what, you know, what, what are your thoughts there? As far as solutions are concerned, the only solutions we have would be to remain open those three days to the public. Um, would it be possible to remain open on a very limited basis, two hours a day for intake or something that would, that would address the hold period but also um, help people that are trying to help these animals? I mean, when when the state mandates that you are open to the public, that's basically what it means is open for stray intake. So, I mean, again, my recommendation would be our staff is going to be working four hours that day anyway. It's going to be two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon to provide care for those animals. So the solution would be just to remain open those three days to the public, and that would eliminate the problem of our um, stray holds, and it would also give the public an opportunity to turn in stray animals. I know that the city did express their concern. Um, they did mention in some email exchanges this afternoon that they had no interest in taking animals from county residents, and they were not planning on doing so either. Mm -hmm. And I reiterated that I don't expect them to. Um, so they will reject county animals, essentially? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, so when you say open to the public on those days, you don't mean a full work day. You mean these limited... Hours. We will be open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, Tuesday, the, 20, the 26th, and then uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thursday, the 28th, and then uh, 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 26th or 27th. You've memorized it. I did, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I would like to hear from my colleagues what they think about it. I don't know what a potential solution is, but I want to uh, 
see what they think and uh, see how we can address what I think is a very legitimate concern and one that uh, is a result of an incredibly dynamic and very successful negotiation process with our workforce, which I am very pleased about. And so that has been extraordinary, but it has brought on, of course, these other last, these things that are just reality and not to, not uh, for anybody to feel bad about. So thank you. I'm going to hear from my call. I'd like to hear from them about a potential solution and Maybe we change nothing. It just depends on the conversation. So thank you. And Chairman Scrivener and members of the board, just to let you know, the plan right now is for the, the county animal shelters, all three county animal shelters, to be closed to the public um, outside of uh, obviously having staff come in and care for those animals. Um, if the board's direction is to remain open those three days, we have a whole staff that's willing to do so. So that's, that's the 26th, 27th, and 28th. Those are the dates where you're that we're currently talking about? Chairman Scrivener, that's correct. Okay. And so on the 29th, what, 20, the Friday the 29th, what about that day? We would be close to the public, but it would still be the same okay. care being because provided. Because it's the 26th already a holiday? Or are we talking about, ex no, okay, all right. Okay. Any comments from Supervisor Couch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would support um, what Mr. Cullen just described. If that doesn't create a problem with the agreement that you all have reached? That, that's one of the questions I had as well. I mean, wouldn't these holidays then, for those, for those folks that worked during that period, then they would be given those days at another point in the year, correct? So they're not losing the, um, the days off. It would go to a different time of year. Is that correct? Chairman Scriver, that's the way I understand it as well. They'd be giving floating holidays to replace right. those. Because we have other, de other departments that are mandated to be open, certain, certain parts of departments, and that's, that's the provision we've made for those folks already. Okay. Anything else, Supervisor Cash? Okay. I'll, I'll move um, the staff's recommendation with the change that Mr. Cullen just described. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Supervisor Magger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our employees for working with us to find a solution that works. We do value you. Please express to our employees that we do. So, and uh, look forward to finding other solutions as we move forward. I also want to thank our staff for uh, their creativity and persevering in the process. So, congratulations. And I, I'm sure we all echo those comments, Supervisor Maggard. Thank you. Uh, I have a request of the CAO's position. Mr. Alsop, you have comments? Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, I just want to be clear on what the, um, what the direction is. Uh, I'm, uh, and I, by the way, if you want to keep animal services open and uh, Mr. Cullen and all of his staff are willing to work uh, those three days and they think it's important, uh, then uh, that's great. We were trying to, uh, we were attempting to do something that was rather complicated in a, in a easy way, uh, manageable way. Um, and so I'm supportive of, uh, of that. We're also closed this Friday. Uh, and I'm not sure what they do when we're closed this Friday. Um, but uh, um, anything that they, they need and uh, you want to do, we're supportive of. Thank you. Supervisor Press. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to give a special thank you to uh, our CAO and his team. Uh, Devin has been uh, at this for some time uh, and has developed an exceptional expertise. So grateful to the SEIU bargaining unit, uh, the folks that I think have been incredibly versatile, flexible, and understanding with the county's tough financial position that we're in. And Ryan, I just am so grateful for your leadership, your style, your tone. Uh, you know, we've made major progress under your leadership that I uh, had not seen before. So, uh, Devin, thank you for your, uh, your expertise, your concern, and for closing this chapter uh, so that uh, you know, we begin anew in the new year, which I'm quite excited about. So thank you, and I support uh, Supervisor Couch's motion to keep, keep to address this issue in a way that really makes sense for animal welfare and our relationship with the city and what is otherwise a pretty complicated issue. Uh, shouldn't be, but <laughs> it certainly uh, has been over, over the years. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Perez. Okay, so um, everyone on the board, are we all good with the language that uh, Mr. Nations proposed? To add, okay. So, um, so Mr. Nations, uh, <clears throat> I thought of something better. <laughs> um, 
uh, what it would say now is uh, existing paragraph three would become paragraph four. We would insert a new paragraph three which says county departments who will remain open to provide public services shall make available to the public their schedule for such services during the winter recess and how to access them. And that would be the, the, the full uh, content. Okay, very good. All right, so we have a motion, a second, any other discussion? CO, you're good with the direction? Okay, all right, please cast your votes. Thank you, Mr. Collin. I'm sorry, excuse me, we have to vote on these separately, so let's start with number 60. Okay. Uh, wait, we had, we had a, uh, the clerk and I, I think we, need... we were, I think we were voting on number 64. Okay, on 64. On the resolution, is that, is that correct, Mr. Couch? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so we're on 64, okay, so that was for item 64. Okay, so we have a motion, a second on item 64, please cast your votes. And, oh, excuse me. And I, oh, okay, let's try that again. Okay, we're gonna do it Hang again. On. one second. This is my last meeting, you don't want me to get out of here easy, is that what you're doing? <laughs> Okay, this is for item 64. Okay, please cast your votes. Item 64 is approved, all eyes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, so let's start with item 60. We have staff's recommendation on that. Do we have a, a motion? So, so moved. Second. Okay, motion and second on staff's recommendation. Please cast your votes. Thank you, yeah. the vote is all eyes. Thank you. Okay, item 61. Motion on staff's recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second on second. staff's recommendation. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved, all eyes. Now item 62. Motion. Second. Motion is second on staff's recommendation. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved, all eyes. Thank you. And finally, item 63. This is to adopt resolution. Motion. Second. Motion is second. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved, all eyes. Thank you. That brings us to the conclusion of our agenda this afternoon. And um, our next meeting will be on January 8th at 12 noon to select the new chairman. Do we have a motion to adjourn to January 8th? So moved. We are adjourned.